Welcome to I Finally Get It. On this week's episode, we sit down with J.D. Regar. He's the Chief Nut Officer at Cane River Pecan Company. In studio with me as always, Dustin Webb, our producer. I'm Jeff Martin, your host. Let's get it. I tell you one of the things, I, one of the things I finally get is that half the battle out there is just getting up and getting after it every day. You know, That's right. I, the grit of being a business owner and being self-employed in the day is it really is up to you and all eyes are on you. You yeah, know, yeah. when you go into the office, everybody's looking for you for direction. Everybody's looking for you for the next big idea. Yeah. Everybody's looking for you to solve whatever crisis your company's in at the moment. Getting up and getting in there is half the battle. You finally start to get it a little bit after you've been in it for two decades, too. You it, know, it, I mean, it does. It I'm often. going into my 23rd year of running this company. And so you learn not to panic yeah. ever. Yeah. You learn that the more the serious the issue is, the more calmer you need to be in order to guide and to lead effectively. And uh, those are some of the things you get. But you will get it the longer you are in it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, And sometimes when you struggle with it, for a while. You mentioned leadership and you are a leader. I'd love to hear some stories about uh, how you came up in this business Mm -hmm. and how your leadership has evolved. You know, it's funny about coming up in the business. Of course, my family, we've been in the pecan business, the Louisiana pecan business since the year I was born. My father and his brother bought some pecan orchards in Natchitoches Parish along the Cane River. And that's where our business namesake, Cane River Pecan Company, comes from. But I grew up in New Iberia. So my family was from New Iberia, but we, my dad would go up to Natchitoches and farm for three three and a half months a year, right? I was in the business, but like all high school kids, you know, you're not really paying attention to what your parents are even doing. It's really funny. You kind of know what they do. My dad was a small town lawyer. He had this pecan farm up in Natchitoches. My mom was a stay-at-home mom with four kids at the house. I have three siblings. And so you don't really pay attention. Then you go off to college and you're really in your own world in college, right? Yeah, for sure. And then you get out of college and you start getting those first uh, jobs of your life, first, second jobs. And so I bumped around for about 12 years after college. I worked mostly in sports marketing. And my last job was the corporate sales manager at the Chicago Bears. And I would have been very happy staying in Chicago. Mm -hmm. I started to try to think, well, what would be my next move if I stayed in sports. Uh, I thought maybe even working for the Olympic Committee would be fun. I can move around the country, maybe the world with the U.S. Olympics. I also thought about maybe working for the actual National Football League in New York because they put on their own you know, events themselves, the draft, you know, the all-star, the all-pro, Pro Bowl, I mean, the Super Bowl, of course. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of opportunities to stay, but I, I just really missed Louisiana and I wanted to get back. And My dad had passed away about a year before I decided to come home. And my mom was like, you know, I don't know. This pecan thing's been good, but I don't need to keep doing it. Your dad left me in good shape. And I think I'm just going to, you know, put it aside. Yeah. And I got thinking about self-employment. That's what really drove me at first, self-employment. The idea that I could go and do my own thing. And I, I was always a creative person. And at first I thought maybe my creativity would be somewhat put on hold in a business like Pecans. But I found the opposite, Jeff. I, I found that I, I could be as creative as I wanted to be. And we've been extraordinarily creative in how we promote and market pecans, both regionally, locally, and nationally. Yeah. So it's been a great outlet for my creativity, which I didn't think would have been years ago. Yeah. But I'm also finding out that I don't care what kind of business you're in. You can be as creative as you want. You want to be in clothing business. You want to sell right. glass. Right. Glassware, you it doesn't matter, guitars. You can be as creative as you want to be. And I found you know that what? to be I, I illuminating. You, that is a huge <laughs> light bulb moment though. And for the people out there listening, they really need to hear that because yeah. you think it's just the humdrum day in and day out. You can be as creative as you want to, yeah. regardless of the business. Doesn't matter if you're a, a lawyer or a physician. Yeah. Uh, and even some of these businesses that have been around for so long, it could be like, like a CPA. I mean, some people yeah. could look at that as, oh, it's just everyday grind, everyday grind. Or you could say, well, it doesn't have to be that way. We can make it a little different at our shop, you know? So anyway, got came back to Louisiana 22, 23 years ago and started running the company. And uh, it's just been an amazing journey. Uh, we've grown it. 
quite a bit. When I took over, we were doing less than $200,000 a year in, in uh, gift sales. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now multi-million dollar annual gift sales company. We have a national catalog that goes out nationwide. We have a fully functioning, robust website, of course. We've got a brick and mortar store in New Iberia in the historic district on Main Street, where we should be. A company yeah. like ours deserves to be on Main Street. <laughs> and we have a little 55 seat cafe that we opened up last Last year called Pie Bar. So we've got this yeah. little restaurant, we got this gift shop, we got a fulfillment center, marketing, all of that's happening under one roof now, which is nice. We need to send, like, the tourist commission needs to send people down there. <laughs> they that's, have. That's great. Oh, they have. What you need to do is start doing, we need to do this over coffee and pie one day. That's uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there. Uh, no, it's been good. The, the cafe came out beautiful. We took over an old department store that had been yeah. shut down for about six years. And for the city of New Iberia, it's been great because we took over a blighted building. Uh -huh. We're in. We're one of the anchor tenants of historic downtown New Iberia. We've increased the size of our business. We've hired more people, we're paying more taxes, doing more sales, paying more taxes. Absolutely. We got tourists coming to our location, which they weren't coming to our side of Main Street. So we've just been like a win, 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 win for the city of New Iberia. Yep. And as a result, they've they've really responded and they've supported us, which has been great. I love that. How many people do you employ today? So we've got about 35 to 42 full time. And yeah. then we probably got another 30 or so during the holidays that we've sure. got to bring in on seasonal work. So at our peak, we're somewhere between 75, 80 people. It's yeah. quite a load of people for that size building. And we've, we're running so many different things under one roof. It, you know, Some people work in the kitchen and some people work in fulfillment. Some people work in customer service, some people in finance. You know, so it's yeah. like, yeah. it's crazy, but it's kind of cool. It's from a $200,000 business. This yeah. is what you've done. And, yeah. and really is, it's about the creativity and your mind and, and bringing this to fun. What I want the listeners to hear, and they're never going to play it back, it, but so I want to bring it up again. It's gift. And, and to me, your packaging. Talk to us about the packaging yeah. that you sent. Thing. Is that, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, it's nice. It, it, thank you. Um, you know, we wanted to position ourselves from the beginning as a high end pecan gifting company specific to pecans and specific to gifting. And so what I love about the gifting industry is that the downside is that most companies only gift once a year. Mm -hmm. Consumers will buy all year long. Correct, like, you know, correct. You, you like something, you, you, you have a favorite restaurant in town, you might go seven, eight times in a given year, right? Businesses are only gonna buy gifts once a year, but the business, but the size of the orders are so big. Yeah, they can yeah, be yeah, so big, right? Yeah. So that's what we love about that. And I do like the fact that my business has this extreme seasonality to it, right? right? So we're extraordinarily busy in October, November, December, and we have this, it just drops like a lead balloon. And then we're just kind of coasting by until we get to next September, October. And that's when we do a lot of our work, you know, leading up to the next fall. You know, we start working in January on next September. I used to go around the office and people would be exhausted from Christmas. You know, we just ended and walk in January 1st and say, so in nine months till we drop the first catalog. And they're like, ah, nine months doesn't sound very long, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, correct. So if you're going to do new items, uh, new products, new packaging, anything, you, 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 don't, you don't have much time to work on it. So the business gifting was always part of our DNA from the very beginning. Now we sell pecans to anybody yep. year round, yep. but you know, in May, we might have 20 packages going out. In November, I might have, you know, 3,200 packages going out in a day. So yep. it's a big difference. And the packaging, to your point, had to be business worthy. I mean, we really view ourselves kind of a partner. So if a local law firm wants to give away 500 gifts on behalf of their lawyers, we want to make them feel like, you know, this is quality and that when the recipients get this gift, it's uh, representative of the caliber of law firm that's giving it. That's right. And that's why so the packaging you, has to do be. Do you guys it make is. those tins? We actually, the, the tins are physically made. They were made in China for uh -huh, many years. Uh -huh. And when Trump came into office, uh, there was a, you know, the tariff war was going on. China was charging us tariffs and we were charging them tariffs to get even. And so tins got caught up in that. And I was paying uh, like an extra uh -oh. 30,000 a year for, for tariffs. Yeah just bottom line tariff money. And I was like, oh no, this, I'm too small yeah. of a company to absorb that. Yeah. So one day in my office on a random Thursday afternoon, I came across a company in of all places, Istanbul, Turkey. 
Oh, wow. And I reached, they had a 312 number for my days in Chicago. I recognized that as a Chicago number, and I thought mm-hmm. that was strange, so I called it. Ten minutes later, this guy calls me back, and he's speaking perfect English. And I said, well, where are you? And he's like, I've been in Istanbul. I'm like, really? <laughs> I said, uh, are you an American? He goes, no, I'm I'm third generation. My family owns this place, but I lived in Oklahoma as, a, as an exchange student. And then I went to the University of Purdue that I graduated from, and I lived in Chicago like for six years. Unbelievable. So it was like almost American guy. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And we moved all of our business from China to Istanbul four years ago, and it's been fantastic. That's great. But but you think of these ideas, like I, I saw a New Orleans trolley car. Yeah, a streetcar, Tim. Yeah, streetcar. Yeah. And, and that is, it's beautiful. You know, we developed that product because we wanted to take advantage of the number of trade shows and conventions that go on mm-hmm. in New Orleans and really what they be, what it's become is become what they call a turndown gift and so let's say there's a convention going on in New Orleans that might uh, might attract uh, 3,000 participants uh, let's say okay there might be 20 to 100 people that are VIPs maybe they're speakers maybe they're presenting maybe they're a vendor of the company somebody else makes that determination and they need 50 to 100 gifts to have like when they check in like welcome to New Orleans yeah, correct, correct. looking forward to having you this week well, we think that that little streetcar tin, which we did a lot of work on, it's a proprietary yeah, it's tin. We it's had it made in China. That they'll say, oh, well, let's give these streetcar tins. These make good mementos. They can hang up them on your shelf up here next to your football. Uh, uh, that's right. And so that was the genesis behind that gift. It's, it's, it's done well. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's been amazing. good. So let's get back to this. You just got to show up. Was there ever a time, and I kind of have a feeling there wasn't, but was there a time when you didn't feel like going in? Not really. To work I mean, or- we've had our, we've had our, ups and downs as a company like every other company has for sure you know one of the some of the great leaders will tell you brutally honest stories about how you know early on there's just it's just hard to lift off sometimes right Mm -hmm. all sorts of challenges come your way but yeah you know 2008 after the crisis the the housing crisis was it 2008 or 12 i'm trying to get on my Uh, i'm getting on my crisis seven and eight seven and eight we've had an oil field crisis we've had a housing crisis we've had hurricane crisis here Mm. in Louisiana, BP oil spill crisis, you know, the COVID crisis. I was, you know, COVID was something because we were scared to death because we rely on our catalog mailings to go out nationwide. Yeah, Nobody was going to the office. I didn't Mm. have their home address. You're right. It got me freaked. And so, but what we found out was some kind of way people started going online looking for what they needed and they remembered our company and we actually thrived during the COVID. Yeah, because we, <laughs> well, were, it, we, were, mail, we were mail we were a mail yeah. order company. That's right. And so actually one of the big challenges in the in the in the specialty food gifting space, which that is a thing, mm-hmm. and I belong to a larger group of, of guys that are in that business and we have about thirty five members that we meet monthly on a Zoom call. And everything from people to sell specialty meats to specialty citrus to nuts and and, and cookies and uh, all sorts of different products. We talk about how uh, now that COVID's over and people kind of are going back to the way they they lived prior and getting out to the stores and buying what they need locally, which is great. Uh, we've we've lost some of that mail order business that we picked up so quickly in twenty and twenty one. Yeah. So how do we how do we combat that? That's one of the challenges we have before us all right now. But no, there was never really a time that I thought, oh, I just don't want to go in. No, it never <laughs> yeah, has you're been. You're pretty energetic. Well, I, I do, and I've got a lot of things going on. I mean, I find myself, I'm not that old, I'm only 54, but I do find myself getting sometimes a little tireder at the end of the week. Yeah. And But as a self-employed person, I can I can adjust my schedule. If I want to go in early and kick out of there later, or if I want to go later and stay late, I can do that too. And, yeah. and that's one of the beauties of being self-employed, you know, is yeah. you get to pick your schedule. If that's you right. Just, that's if you right. pick not to go, that's a problem. <laughs> as yeah. long as you keep showing up, you know. Yeah, I get uh, it. But you can do that. You know, all my friends who are doctors and lawyers, I tell them all the time, I say, you are the product. If you don't go, you don't make money. That's exactly you know, right. For me, the pecans are the product. I just got to make sure that I can get them to the person who wants them. Yeah. And I've got a team of people doing that. I've got a great uh, executive team right now that have been with me for each one of us has been with me more than 15 years. And the, of course, there's an art to that, right? There is. Putting together the executive team. I'd say that's one of the more challenging, most important things you'll do as a leader is putting together your small, trusted team. Yep. Um, and if you can get that put away, boy, I tell you, you can make some real gains because you can step back not only to, for self-preservation and keeping your energy high, but you can step back from the day-to-day operations and see how it's being run and then just kind of hover above that and 
try to find where you can fix things. I kind of feel like that's my responsibility now. Yeah, yeah correct. You you, know? You've got. I owe there. it to them. Yeah, yeah, no Not doubt to about myself. it. I owe yep. it to them because now what we've done, these employees that I spoke to you earlier about, these 35 to 40 full timers, we've created this our own little ecosystem now, right? Mm -hmm. So as the mother hen, I got to make sure the ecosystem stays tight. That's right. It's for everybody. I mean, that's obviously right. I benefit from it, no doubt. Sure. But, but they do too. Yep. And so no, I'm that's... always reminding them that we're all in this together. I always used to make be very conscientious about talking about my my employees as my coworkers. Yeah. I mean, financially we aren't treated the same. Sure. But they are my coworkers. Yeah. You know, I rely on them. They rely on me. Sure. They want to make sure that like sales and marketing falls under my preview. They want to make sure that, hey, you better be selling and marketing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because you know, we want we're product. counting on you. Yeah, we're counting on you, just like <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. counting on them. That's right. To negotiate UPS deals or to get the product in and out with the vendors or inventory right. correct and making sure all the technology is working properly that we use. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah we're all we're still relying on each other over there. I want to go back to your employment days. You just kind of touched yeah. on self employment. Yeah. Employment days to self employment. You ever regret doing that? I, mm -mm, no. Yeah. When I first became uh, the head of the company. I lived with what I used to call owner's guilt sometimes, which is I'm sure some of your other um, folks that you've invited in here, maybe there's a different word for it, but I always call it this idea that you got paid more. Maybe you took more vacation. Maybe you there were some other perks that you took advantage of that weren't allowed for the other folks in the room. Right. And I used to feel bad about that. And I was really kind of always, you know, I tamp it down. I never made a big deal about it still to this day. But sure. I mean, I just was conscientious about it all the time. Right. Until one day I figured out that, you know what? There are some people in this world that are just fine wanting to be employees. Absolutely. They do not want to be employers. And there's a certain amount of risk and headache that goes with being the employer. That's right. Is also the fact that I never get to turn this thing off, right? A lot of my employees will check out at five and check back in at eight and they're good and they're loyal and they're trustworthy and they're passionate and they're hardworking. Yep. But they don't think about the business the way I do. <laughs> That's exactly right. And they right. turn it off and I never get a chance to turn it off. So ultimately I'm always in the business, right? I took a lot of risk moving my company to a new building, renovating this building, putting this cafe in, uh, some people along the way tell me, hey, why are you doing that? You should do it this way, not that way. But I felt like those were the ways that we needed to do it. So there was some risk taking with that. And so I took all that burden on. That, and, now I'm exactly. gonna, and now I'm I'm ready to compensate myself for that burden. And when I say compensate, the first thing you might think is money. It's not necessarily always in money. It could be in time off. Time. You know, yep. last year I took the whole month of January off. I went to Australia. It was fantastic. I mean, I mean, literally, I mean, like you can't do much from Australia if something happens. Like you're really at the mercy of your employees. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's a lot of trust right there, right? That's right. And then I took some other extended trips during the year. And this year I've got two big trips planned. One's for three weeks back to Europe. And then another one is to, uh, well, two to Europe, actually. So, you know, that's a form of compensation to yourself, for right? Sure. You have to get over the fact that um, you're... You, you, that you're stressed by being the employer and not feeling guilty about it. I feel great that I can give as many people as I have jobs. Yeah, hey, absolutely. And I should feel good about that. That's right. And I've created an economy that requires that many people to be there. And I should feel great about that too. That's right. So it took me a while to kind of get over that. And maybe some of your younger um, leaders, uh, business leaders may feel that way. I don't think that was unique to me, yeah. but, uh, but Hey, some people are, I had to, I had to remember that some people were just fine being the clock in clock out people. And, and they are. Yeah. And, and thank God Cause you for think nobody is. Yeah. Agree, you, correct. Correct. But they, they really don't want that responsibility. No, they, they don't, don't want that, don't. that type of, um, it, it's really the responsibility. They don't want the responsibility. Yeah, correct. Yeah, so correct. that's been good. So moving from an employee to an employer, uh, it didn't take me too long. It just had to get over that little guilty hump for for a few years. Got but it. I'm over it now. <laughs> that's good. So what do you do for fun? Well, I, you know, I, I love that question. Um, you know, I, I, I meet other business leaders all the time and we talk business. And I'm I always like, hey, you got any hobbies or what do you do for fun? We're not working. I think it gives you a little insight to what people are up to. I have discovered at, the, at 54 years old, I'm a creator. I like to create stuff. For sure. And it's just in my blood. I, I, I can't stop. 
I try to stop. I'm, I, I'm in the process right now. I've, I've written six children's books, and I'm in the process of writing my first novel. We've got the first draft done. I'm co-writing with another friend of mine from New Iberia. we got a great story. I should be done with that, fully edited, done in about six months. So that's been great. It's been an idea that I've been sitting on for more than 15 years. That I've just been sitting and sitting and sitting and ran to an old friend of mine from New Iberia. I said, have you, he was a writer. I said, have you ever collaborated? And he said, no. I said, would you be, would you like to? He said, well, what do you have in mind? And spilled the beans on the story. And he's like, that sounds great. Let's go. And then boom, yeah. he was off to the races. So we'd work on that. And I've got, I've been doing guided alligator hunts in Louisiana for 22 no years. Way. Yeah. I've been doing that for a long time. I've got a piece of property that my family owned in North Louisiana, not far from where our orchards were located in yeah. Natchitoches. And it just so happens to have a, a water feature on the property. It's got a 350 acre Cypress Lake. It's, and oh, it's, wow. it's like right out of the movies. It's beautiful. Yeah. And we happen to have alligators there and we got licenses uh, for alligators or tags rather years ago. And for the first two years, I invited some buddies. We shot some alligators, harvested them, sold them for so much dollars a foot. And it barely paid the beer money. Yeah, yeah. So I said, wait a minute, let me figure about this. So it turned out that instead of selling alligators, I started selling the hunts. And so we, I started marketing corporate alligator hunts. So instead of you going golfing or going fishing with your company and your small leadership team, why don't you come alligator hunting in Louisiana? How cool is that? Yeah. And it was way before Swamp People and all that stuff got started. And uh, every year we've made it a little better. And I've got 20. 23 years under my belt doing that and it's, that's incredible it is it's been incredible and i've met people from all over the country so if, if somebody wanted to do a corporate retreat yeah yep. and, and with an alligator yep. hunt or without we, we can do you that you have a, a yep. place there so we have a facility on site that sleeps 12 people yep. so it's a small graph gathering it's intimate mm -hmm. we we try not to get a bigger group than eight yeah we can bring in we've brought in private chefs we've brought in cajun bands we've brought in all kinds of things. And it's it's an old camp. It was built in 1946. We put a few creature comforts in there, but for the most part, we've left it very rustic. And it sits on this hill overlooking the Cypress Lake. It's full of alligators. Yeah. It's been cool, man. Very you mentioned cool. that you were creative. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's and then crazy. Uh, I've got, I was, you and I were visiting a little bit earlier about this. I started a toy company about 22 years ago. We made toy soldiers, yeah. but I do uh, marching bands, college marching bands. And we've done about 14 different college marching bands in miniature. And it's kind of a, a, a niche thing, no doubt about it. Very, yeah. But for folks who grew up, uh, went to college and were maybe were in the band, uh, it's a big deal. It's how they spent their four years and a lot of dedication there. And it's just been a fun thing. I'm a big fan of college football. Um, I'm a huge fan of the pageantry of college football. I mean, you're an LSU grad. I'm an LSU grad. We don't need to talk to each other about tailgating. We know what real tailgating looks that, like. That's exactly right. Uh, we know what you know celebrations look like and championships look like. I couldn't possibly think about going to a football game in the South and not having the band there. And the band, even, even the visiting such, band. The visiting band, like when Texas A and M <laughs> oh, comes. Yeah. To, oh, unbelievable! They're the best. And they really so are. you know, it just adds to game day. It adds yeah. to the pageantry. And I thought, man, that'd be cool. And I started the company. We did Texas A and M was the first band we ever did. I got my master's at Texas A and M, so I was. A little bit familiar with AM and the Corps yep. of Cadets. Yep. And then we did LSU. And then from there, we've done a bunch of different schools. The last school we just finished was the University of Tennessee. And before that, it was Wisconsin. And each of these schools have their own little band traditions. Yeah, and sure. I wasn't in a band. I never played an instrument in my life. I didn't know anything about cadence or the way the formation of marching or their uniforms. I, I couldn't tell you the difference between a marching mellophone and an and a, and a, and a alto sax until I got yeah. into this. I had to learn all sorts of stuff. And then, of course, each school has its own traditions, like the, the University of Southern California. They always wear sunglasses. Always. Huh. And and every so every little guy's got little sunglasses. And now on. I'll never not see not that. that right? I, yeah, that's <laughs> and amazing. like the Irish Guard at, at the University of Notre Dame, this the, they're a ceremonial group of guys that wear the kilts, and they yeah. Yeah. you got to be six foot two to even be considered to be an Irish Guard. They they want them all six foot two or taller. Yeah. And so there's just been a little nuances there I've learned, and I go to this show in Chicago. I try to go every couple of years. It's a it's a world uh, trade show for toy soldiers. I call it my Geek Week, and I go up there and I 
sit in a hotel room with all these other hobbyists and we show our we showcase our stuff for two days in a hotel room <laughs> and we great. take over like four floors of this hotel and people just walk from room to room it's, no it's wild way. and i get to decorate my room with college pennants and play the fight song and serve up white chicken wings <laughs> and they love it because they're like oh hey, this is different it's that kind of is cool. outstanding yeah it's, it's fun and i'm going to london this year to a show there i've been to years ago i hadn't been in about 10 years but looking forward to that so yeah yeah all these little projects i have keep me busy and it lets you get that creative oh. juice out yeah you, you know what but I, mean? I get to do that in the pecan business too i mean yeah, like whether sure. it's the way we market or whether it's bringing a new product to market a couple of years ago before we opened up our cafe which is called pie bar we wanted to have a signature pie even though we're in the pecan business and we plan to have a pecan pie i thought man we gotta have a like an interesting local take on this and so we created a boudin pie and it's a no it's kidding. a boudin, it's a pot it's a nine inch pie deep dish it's got a pound and a half of uncased boudin. It's got a sweet potato souffle, and then it's covered in a praline pecan glaze. Oh, yeah. So I have yeah. the pecans in there, yeah. but I also got the boudin in there, which is our local delicacy, right? And it's just kind of a way to put a creative twist on something that's very well known. Do you have any other hearty pies other than the- Well, yeah, like, we sell some savory. We sell some- Savory, I guess. Well, well, that's a savory pie, but we sell some other, you know, we have obviously pecan pie and apple pie, and we've got, got some it. cheesecakes with pecan filling, but we also uh, rotate a lot of seasonal cakes and pies. We'll have key lime pie in the summer. And, yeah, sure. And other pies in the winter. Yeah. So we do You're all that stuff. You're fascinating, man. man. You are fascinating. Yeah, I appreciate it. I just, I, I guess the, the, the thing that I'm, and I always uh, do a little outtake is what I learned from this episode. And, and I'm going to tell you what, let your creative juices flow. You know what I mean? And the and thing about fun. being creative is that I probably... The, comp the pecan company obviously takes most of my bandwidth, no question about it, right? The, the smaller companies take a small amount of my bandwidth, but it gives me a, it does give me a creative outlet. But it does get me to think about the pecan business a little differently too, right? Because, mm. look, there's a lot of pecan companies in the country. I don't expect you to know who they are, but I know who they are because I'm in the business, right? Sure. And they're, they're in Louisiana and they're in Texas and they're in Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas. And I know all the ones that are in this regional five-state region. We're doing it different than all of them. Right. Hands down. Another another light bulb moment there. Because you you're 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 engaged and you're engaged in your community of pecan manufacturers and distributors, whatever. But you're doing it differently because you've look outside of the the, the industry. That's well just genius. Well, though. we look outside and we want to do it differently because not only do I know of them. When I'm out traveling about, I, I go out of my way to visit these little pecan shops. And most of these pecan companies are family companies like ours. That, that's right. But most of them are based in the rural parts of the country because they're basically opened a little store outside the farm and the farm is on the outskirts of town. That's right. They're not in the cities and stuff. Now, Lafayette's not a big city, but it's a city. Yeah. When I think about my corporate background, when I used to work for the Chicago Bears, I was the corporate sales manager. So we were calling on big companies like United Airlines and Gatorade and Nike and AT&T and Coca-Cola, Budweiser, big companies. I kind of took this big company idea and said, well, let's see if we sell these pecans to these bigger companies. What would that look like? My counterparts just have never been able to yeah. adopt that. Yeah, correct. And it is a game changer for us. <laughs> it's it's no a doubt game about changer. It. And we love it. And just when you think you've had enough creativity, there's five projects right now. On my de I'm thinking about right now. I've got five projects on my desk right now that are, we're hoping to debut for next year. Now, some of them are just packaging and some of them are a whole new product. Yeah, sure, um, so sure. uh, all, we're always thinking about new ideas. Of course, as you get older as a business leader, you know, saying no is as, almost as important. Important, for as sure. Saying yes, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm saying what to say no to. Yeah. You get. I've gotten really good at that as I've gotten older. I will tell you that. Yeah, that's that's one huge, thing that comes with that's it. That's a huge yeah. light bulb yeah. there too. Knowing how to say no, when yeah. to say no, who that's to right. say no to. Because boy, when you're when you're younger and you're trying to grow a business, and you you find a little stream of success, it's like these little tributaries that are coming off that stream. Like, well, what if we did this too? And what if we did? And before you know, it, you look up twenty years later, and the company doesn't really resemble much of what yeah. you thought it was going to be. That's right. And you got to start worrying about like, what do we need to call here? What's dead weight, right? That's right. It's going to free us up. That's right. So we had started a company in 2008 called LouisianaLiving.com. And basically, it was like Cane River Pecan, but it was all the other Louisiana things that we the love. The flavors King of- cake, yeah, yeah. gumbo. Yeah, correct. Boudin, correct. crawfish, all by mail. 
And it was just not working out because it was growing in the fourth quarter, like our pecan company was growing. I said, now they're competing with each other. So yep. Yep. Th- four years in, we had to completely abolish ID and cut it, cut, yep. cut yep. bait and move on just with pecans. And I'm glad we did because it was it was serving as too big of a distraction. Yeah, correct. And so correct. now our business model is kind of like, I don't feel the, the need to add a lot of SKUs to our offering. We don't have to have a lot of different products. Mm-hmm. What we need to do is get in front of more people. Yes. This is a very yeah. big country we live in. It's yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. I don't know about you, man, but whenever I'm flying and we take off out of an airport like Dallas or Chicago, all I do is look down below, right by the airport. It's always where the warehouses are. That, that's right. And there's so many, and they're yeah. so big. They're huge. And you're thinking, what is in that warehouse? I know. I, if I took all the pecans I sold in a whole year, it wouldn't even take a fraction of that wet warehouse. It, it's right. It's right. And I'm thinking to myself, we live in a big world. Yeah. I see uh, the same thing with 18 wheelers. You know what I mean? They're going oh, up and down the street. Oh, and, and it's like, holy cow. So knowing that, you know, how big of an area we have to serve, I, I feel like not having a lot of SKUs now is more important than the reach that we can have. Let's do what we do really well to, for a lot of people. Yeah, that's right. It's been successful uh, so far. And I think the sky's the limit for what we're doing. I mean, the only thing that's really holding us back right now for real growth is the size of our building, the physical footprint that we yeah, have the capacity to actually to, yeah. do the fulfillment side of the yeah, business. You and know? you're probably going to continue to run into it as you as you grow. Yeah. And but so, we're going to get to a place where I've, I'm going to feel like, you know what? This is a good size. It's good enough. This is yeah, manageable. That's right. that's right. I got a lot of people working here. Um, everyone's making a good living here. Yep. This is an admirable size, and I don't have to be much bigger than this. And we're going to try to maintain a, a, a level. And we're not there yet, but we're close. Yeah. 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 And, and yet, I don't want to reach over again because, you yeah. know, I'm just, my arm's going to be tired. <laughs> you you, you get uh, a little red button. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. <laughs> but that is a lesson as well. So, you know, you have you have shared so many things, and I'm going to list everything in the show notes. So you, you ever heard of that book, Small Giants? No. So it's a good book. So it came out about the time Good to Great came out. I see you in your bookshelf, Good to Great. So there's Small Giants is a good book. It talks about these companies that were very successful that purposely kept themselves smaller. Yeah. Now, yeah. when I say small, I mean, it's relative, right? Depends what industry you are. But just the idea that just being bigger is not always better, Correct. right? Correct. And to understand that you can make a great living for you yourself and for your family, and you can be responsibly a certain size where no one, nothing really is too much at risk, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's always a risk in business. I don't care what it is. I mean, like, we're about to have this huge freeze coming through Louisiana uh, in the next two days. I mean, there's a risk. There's There could be some things that happen during this freeze. Some things could freeze up. Some pipes could burst. If you own the company, you got to go in there and get it all cleaned up and fixed up and ready to go again. So right. hurricanes are always going to be a risk down here. This drought we went through this past year was no joke. I mean, like that's for real. And and the, the interest rates going up this year scared a lot of people from spending money. And that's, that's right. a risk. There's a business. Life is business. Life is fraught yeah, <laughs> with yeah. risk. And there's no doubt about it. And you got to be a little tougher. Yeah. Around the edges. Uh, that's another thing. You know, you got to have thick skin. You got to be able to think clearly, really yeah. clearly when things get really bad or potentially bad. Yeah. Just think clear. Yeah. I, I typically ask for a business tip, but yeah. you've given so many. <laughs> um, we can we can take those or you can give us another business tip. A business. I don't know if there, I, I live or die by any particular. Well, I, I do tell my staff all the time that hope is not a plan. Uh, <laughs> that's more of a, just a little mantra that I like to write on the whiteboards to remind everybody that, look, we're not going to hope ourselves out of anything. That's right. Like we hope it doesn't get cold. Or we hope the economy improves. or We hope people uh, do business with us. What I've also learned is people don't quit doing business. People just quit doing business with you. Absolutely. You're and right. so the law firm that bought pecans from us for three years is not all of a sudden going to quit giving gifts. They're just going to go gift from somebody else. That's right. So we have to be cognizant of that. We have to be cognizant of also our, our mutual friend, Fred Reggie, gave me a great saying, we serve to serve again. That's right. This idea that, you know, we are in the service business and we have to continue to do it to the best of our abilities so we can do it again for that same person. Amen. And so if, 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 if there's a few tips in there somewhere, you know, hope is not a plan and, and we're here to serve to serve again. And I also think one of the pro tips is two, two things that I think of now that I'm 22, 23 years into this is that obviously getting up and showing up is a big part of business, right? right. And, and going into work like you mean it. That's right. Like today I'm wearing a ball cap. I don't normally wear ball caps and uh, I'm not, I'm not, um, 
what do they call that? Uh, they call it hat fishing. You ever you've heard of cat fishing? Cat fishing, yeah. Cat, yeah, cat yeah, fishing yeah. is when ball guys wear caps. So they oh don't yeah, wear yeah, ball. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm you, not hat fishing. Yeah, not <laughs> I just did. I just threw my King River hat on today. Is that but, one of your some of your gear? Yeah, this is I my King. This is my pecans. I love. It. I'm not hat fishing anybody, but the point is, is that usually <laughs> I'm showing up to work and you know I've got a coat on and I'm and I want to dress the part because I need everyone to kind of understand that look we're here it's serious business and that's right we're taking care of our business. I also believe that. Um, having a lot of humility and and really viewing your employers or employees rather viewing your employees as a as a coworker yeah has helped me a lot yeah I have a lot of empathy for the people that work for us it's funny cuz that the bigger the situation that we have the bigger the goof up that we've had to encounter the calmer and the more flexibility i have yeah you know yeah. and yeah. that's that's served me personally really well at yep. the office. Yeah, and that's good advice, yeah. too. But nothing ever goes to plan. <laughs> that's that's a 100% right. Um, Got a plan for the unexpected, yep. always. Yep. And we've been hit with a lot of it. And it's so funny because all the things that have, all the calamities that have occurred, and we talked about, you know, housing crisis and financial crisis and oil field crisis and COVID and BP oil spills and hurricanes. We never see the same thing twice. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm, we're sitting here two yeah, years right. ago, four years ago. And what a COVID? COVID? What? What are you talking about? A pandemic? Like, what does that even mean? And you know, you're talking to a group of I don't know age range of your leaders that you talk to, but I'm 54, so all the things I just mentioned to you that I've been in the workplace for what going on 35 years now. Well, these are all first time occurrences for 30 for a 35 year old. I mean, we've never yeah, been sure. through all these crises that I just mentioned. Maybe the only thing that repeats itself every few years are the hurricane issues, hurricanes. you know. But yeah. other than that, that would be, I mean, oil spill, COVID, <laughs> I know. Yeah. oil field, right. oil field crash. Like, what is that? Like that happened to our parents. Yeah, correct. In the eighties, but yeah. it didn't. We were all in high school, you know, picking boogers. We weren't <laughs> even paying attention. But uh, but now it's like we got to pay attention. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's it's fraught with a lot of uh, challenges. And if you want to grow your business, there's a challenge to that, you know. Yeah, there is borrowing money and having shareholders and um, stakeholders involved that you have to answer to. And there's a lot of that as well. So yeah, that's great. Well, this is uh, this is amazing. So you you go all over the world, obviously for uh, work or for pleasure. Yeah. When when people run into you, how do you how do you hope to leave them different and better just because they met Jenny Rigar? Well, I like to represent, first of all, I love to represent Louisiana in a good way. And you do. I, yeah. I think we live in the most unique state in the country. Um, and there, there's few places that are as unique as the culture right here in Lafayette. I feel like as residents of Lafayette, we are the keepers of the culture of Louisiana. Mm. I really believe that. Um, yeah, there's a culture in New Orleans that doesn't exist here. And maybe there's a culture in North Louisiana that doesn't exist here. But we're so proud of the culture of Lafayette that we've created. It's also up to us to keep it, right? And so I, I like to be a good ambassador for Louisiana. I like to maybe dispel some notions that people have of us in Louisiana. Yeah, we work hard, but we do play hard and yep. we enjoy that side of life, tailgating, Mardi Gras, you know, it, it's eating crawfish, all that stuff. But we also have a very serious side to us. Um, we're hardy people. We've gone through a lot of natural disasters that we've got to kind of uh, make our way through. And so I think the biggest thing is just to leave kind of a friendly impression on people that, you know, um, you can be a leader and you can be humble and you can uh, be self-deprecating, but still be successful at the same time. And I think that's that's kind of what I ch choose to do. I, I made a, I'm a five time boomerang baby. I tell people five times I moved out of Louisiana and moved back. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I lived in Texas and I lived in Mississippi. I lived in Illinois. I lived in Colorado and I lived in Alabama. And so five times I came back. The last time this happened was 23 years ago. I don't think it was going to happen again. <laughs> but I always used to, I used to tell it, I used to call it flying my Louisiana flag when I was out of state. When I lived in those five times I lived out of state, everybody that I worked with or lived near, they all knew I was a Louisiana guy. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I was really proud of our culture. I'm really proud of the language we speak and this, the, the, the music we listen to and the food we cook and the food we consume. And it's never been lost on me. It's pretty cool. And then now that I get to live in Louisiana and work in the food business in Louisiana, which is kind of our calling card yeah. it's our hallmark yeah. right huge part it's of the a culture. really cool thing to be able to kind of rub elbows with the other food people of the state of louisiana whether it's seafood yeah. or it's farming 
or anything in between. It's really a cool life to live. I feel like pecans are part of our Southern heritage. It's kind of part of our culture. Mm -hmm. It's kind of woven itself in. I don't have to explain to anybody what a pecan is. Everybody understands it. They get it. I love that. And uh, we've built a good company with a good reputation the past 20 years. And so now, finally, I'm starting to run into people that have heard of us. Or maybe yeah. Christmas, they were the recipient of somebody. Uh, kind of a funny story. I had an old girlfriend contacted me this week. She lives in Texas. They said that one of her vendors gave her a can of pecans from my company. No <laughs> she lives outside of San Antonio. That's I mean, that's, great. That, isn't that crazy? That is great. And uh, so, hey, man, maybe that means we've made it. I don't know. Yeah, you made it. You're right. <laughs> Well, man, thanks so much for coming Absolutely. on. Absolutely. It was my pleasure, man. You're the best. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. I got a gift for you. Uh-oh. Yeah. Just a little something to think about us next time you ponder. Well, I need to. What does pecan success look like, you know? Yeah. I brought you a golden, a golden nut. Oh, my goodness. This is outstanding. I've got a good friend of mine. He and his I wife. Have a golden nut. They have a jewelry company in uh, Louisiana, and I contacted him about making some nuts for me. And sometimes I'll leave them as a tip. For the waitress, or yeah. leave them some, a leave behind, but it's molded from a little Elliot pecan that I sent to them. Uh, Elliots were first discovered in the Florida Panhandle, nineteen twelve, and they are just a great snacking pecan, and one of about eleven hundred varieties of pecans. And uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, either. yeah, eleven hundred. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. And uh, there you go. Outstanding. Yeah, Thank man. you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining us this week on I Finally Get It. To learn more about what JD's up to, please visit the show notes at ifinallygetit.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you're a business owner and you have a light bulb moment you believe would help other business owners, reach out to me at jeff at ifinallygetit.com.